Welcome everyone to the forum. My name is Patrick Thompson. I'm a congregate here at Grace Cathedral. I'm also a former chair of the Board of Trustees. Delighted to be here today. I also, by day, lead the commercial litigation practice at a law firm called Perkins Coie and serve on the Board of Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. And I think that's why they tapped me for purposes of doing this <laughs> forum today. We are going to be in conversation with Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz about the issue of gun control, the Second Amendment. And we're going to do that over the course of less than an hour. And this conversation comes to you during a forum in which we're focusing this year at Grace Cathedral on the issue of truth. And truth in the context of this community really means thinking about truth for the reality that is and truth for the reality that we as a community of faith really want to see. And part of that truth really involves looking at myths and assumptions and things that we take for granted and we think about in our community and in our culture. And all of that is going to be part of an ongoing dialogue at Grace Cathedral throughout this year. And we're delighted that you can participate in that conversation with us. And at the end, we're going to have an opportunity for you to submit questions uh, in connection with this conversation and interview. But without further ado, our guest today is the author of this book, which is going to be available for purchase after this conversation. It's called Loaded, A Disarming History of the Second Amendment. And what it does is it shines a light on the terrible conflict in the United States about gun violence and a culture of guns. And although recent shootings have brought our attention to the issue of gun control and gun violence in our culture, this has been an issue since the founding of this republic. So thank you for joining us this morning. And I'm going to begin by introducing our special guest. Could you tell the audience a little bit, Roxanne, about your history and your background? Because that'll help frame what brought you to this moment in writing this book. Well, th thank you so much, Patrick. And thank everyone who um, made this possible and all of you coming out so early on Sunday morning. I really appreciate it. Um, I also want to um, acknowledge that we're on the, the unceded lands of the Chumash uh, Nation people, peoples, and um, we should always respect that and remember um, what land we're walking on um, and support their present um, uh, resurgence. <clears throat> so I myself come from rural Oklahoma. Uh, my dad was a tenant farmer. He was... Uh, 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 from a family, the Dunbar family, Scots Irish, uh, starting in the you know Appalachians and Kentucky, and um, uh, getting land and losing land, getting land, losing land. Never enough money to the family to own slaves, which every settler wanted to do because that's the only way they could survive, is to produce cash crops. Um, and they kept, I call them the losers of empire. Um, so the real hardcore losers ended up in Oklahoma. Um, but, <laughs> but most of them were able to get some land because they were just practically giving it away, taking it away from the Indians who had been um, forcibly removed there from east of the Mississippi by Andrew Jackson. Uh, and they were farmers, agriculturalists, going back you know, 15,000 years in that area very rooted in, uh, these are the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, uh, Seminole, and Creek, um, Muscogee people and Cherokee people. And uh, they had been promised, as long as the water flows, um, that that land in Oklahoma, which wasn't very great land, would be theirs. And then they just took it, and they allotted it all. And they opened it up for the run. I don't know if you've ever heard of the 1889 run for Oklahoma. It's the biggest holiday in Oklahoma, <clears throat> even though it didn't become a state until 1907. So my Dunbar grandparents were not, um, they were in Missouri, and they didn't come in the run. Uh, they came in 1907. The run was 89. Um, 
and they came from Missouri. Uh, they had land there, Missouri, um, not much, you know, just food crops. They weren't uh, really uh, wealthy commercial farmers. Um, they they were pro-union, you know, in, in the Civil War. They, they were not necessarily not racist, but uh, they didn't join, you know, Missouri didn't join the Confederacy. So they moved to Oklahoma, um, Canadian County, Oklahoma. It's in uh, south, slightly west, where it becomes the Plains. And, um, and we were, were able to acquire this land really cheap. Uh, but by the next generation, my dad's generation, my grandfather had lost that land. And um, that's a whole story in itself. And I have a memoir called Red Dirt Growing Up Oki, telling my, my wonderful grandfather, who was um, in the Socialist Party, he had nine children. He was a veterinarian and had land. And he was in the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World. And he named my father Moyer Haywood Scarberry Pettibone Dunbar. <laughs> after the founders of the IWW. And the Ku Klux Klan was organized to destroy the Socialist Party and foreign-born people and, um, uh, and uh, the Socialists in Oklahoma. And they ran him out, so he lost his land. And so my dad was a tenant farmer and uh, resented it a great deal. So I understand a lot about the resentment that leads to um, scapegoating Immigrants, Mexicans, scapegoating African Americans, scapegoating women are taking our job. Uh, with all the you know the civil rights and social justice movements, I I understand that because here's this man with that name and he supported George Wallace in 1968. So I grew up in gun culture and there were guns in the house. Fortunately, my mother, who comes from a mixed background, orphan. Uh, part Indian, not even knowing her own uh, tribe or what her, her grandmother's tribe was. Um, there were a lot of lost people in Oklahoma in, in the process. Um, she hated guns, and uh, she never expressed why, but she put the hate of guns in me. And then I tell the story, but later on I, I, I actually had a period of becoming a gun enthusiast myself. Well, let's pause there, <laughs> because that's an interesting thing. The, the, when you start out this book, and it's, it's talking about the disarming history, one of the first things that you talk about in the book, the introduction, is captioned, gun love. Right. So can you tell us a little bit about your experience and your lust for or interest in intrigue in guns yourself? Well, I'm hung up in my... <laughs> <laughs> my scarf here, <laughs> there. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I was, um, uh, I became an, I moved to California and I went to San Francisco State in 1960. And fortunately for me, unlike most people in my family, I, um, I had already been, become anti-racist in Oklahoma because I had married into a family that, uh, of carpenters who uh, the father had, really fought to white, you know, white people who fought to have uh, integrate the um, uh, carpenters union because they're all, you know, hod carriers and laborers and uh, successfully in Oklahoma. So um, I, they gave me a good education and I met African-American carpenters <laughs> uh, who were friends and um, lots of other people who, you know, normally one wouldn't meet like Palestinians and um, and um, uh, Cubans who were supporting the Cuban Revolution, who were students at University of Oklahoma. So I, got, I went there for a year and met my husband. And um, so I became anti-racist and I left Oklahoma because I couldn't stand the bigotry. Also, I was raised a Southern Baptist and um, uh, that um, <laughs> getting away from uh, the Baptists and the, and the racists, I, I just fled and I thought, California, especially San Francisco, was the golden place where there was no racism, <laughs> where there was integration. 
So it is the Golden State, but I still. Would, yeah, <laughs> I went to San Francisco State and got involved in a group doing studying the redlining right there in our neighborhood. You know, and uh, of course this is when Willie Brown was active, um, and the redlining of housing was. A, and I experienced my husband and I when we tried to rent a place right off in San Francisco. Um, the owner, who was an Italian lady, right right over here on where I live now on Russian Hill, um, she said I had to bring my husband in before, you know, she would allow me. She loved me, you know, I was just 20, 20 years old. She thought I was sweet. She was an older lady, and, and I liked her, and um, I, th I thought that was strange, you know, uh, but that evening I took my husband over, and she says, okay, because he's white, you know, and, but I didn't, I said, that was really odd. And so my husband said, well, that's because I'm white, you know, and I said, oh, my God, that exists here. So anyway, I became a wild-eyed revolutionary within a few years because I, uh, also the women's movement, but I, and I went to graduate school after I went to San Francisco State. I studied history, uh, so then I was down at L.A. and UCLA, and then in 1968, I just uh, quit graduate school and became five years of full-time. I called myself a revolutionary. And um, I was in different places. I was in Boston, uh, where we're you know, starting the women's liberation movement in 68. And then um, after a couple of years, moved to New Orleans. And this is where the guns come in. Um, we, I, a couple of us had also gone to Cuba the Vince Ramos Brigade, and we started being threatened by Cuban exiles. They had groups at that time called Omega, and there was another one. They bomb they mostly bombed places. They weren't much into guns. Uh, they did assassinate a few people, but mainly bombing restaurants that were pro-Cuban, you know, uh, pro-Cuban, would have the Cuban flag up, Cuban restaurants that were, uh, or places that, you know, just whoever their enemies were, and they were very big. There was a very big population in New Orleans of, of these exiles. It's only 90 <coughs> miles from New Orleans to, to Cuba. And so, so a lot of the old Cubans who had migrated long before were very pro-revolutionary. So they were mainly attacking them, but they started threatening us. They were going to blow up our wooden, shabby little wooden building and the Irish Channel and... Um, really uh, really scary, because we knew they had done things. They weren't just talking. Then David Duke, who had just become the head of the Klan in New Orleans, he is from Oklahoma, he, um, he started calling and threatening us. And so we started buying guns. We went over to gun shows and got guns. We started going, talking to gunsmiths. And, you know, we wanted to, you know, be safe with the guns. So we... We, you know, I, I tell people they shouldn't, be, most people when they see a gun or see a window with a gun, they turn their head away. And that is a good response because they're very powerful objects. There's nothing like it in the world that a civilian can have in hand. It makes you, well, falsely usually, you know, think you're, they're not for self-defense. They are for killing therefore killing uh, aggressively, shoot first. And um, maybe a shotgun with, with, um, um, with, you know, if you're sitting in a chair and someone breaks in your door, that might, you know, that might be self-defense. I don't know, that's, that's pretty rare. You know, home invasion, that's what they talk about so much, home invasion. But mostly people are going to invade a home like people not to be there so they, <laughs> so they can steal things. <laughs> so anyway, we got our politics. That, uh, also, we had to clean these guns all the time. You do have to clean guns. It, we would go practice shooting, and then we would clean guns. And we'd sit around, do our you know organizing talk um, while we clean guns. And... Um, New Orleans is very, very humid, very moist, and we didn't have air conditioning, and they can just rust really fast, you know, uh, steel. So we, um, uh, we got very attached to them. They become, you know, in the Marine Corps, the Marine uh, recruit sleeps with his rifle, 
He also says, so it, it, it's kind of an erotic object because it's power. And I don't think we talk enough about the sexuality, and unfortunately Freud never got on to that. Uh, <laughs> I don't think he, he knew guns existed, probably, even. But um, he, uh, the, you can really apply psychoanalytical theory and really look at the fetish of the gun. And um, so all these big, you know, the, there are 300 million guns and 300 million people in this country, but only 30 million people in the United States own a, even one gun. Okay, let's, let's talk about that yeah. a little bit. So you went from someone who, you were a revolutionary, you bought a bunch of guns, you're cleaning them, dealing with them, mm -hmm. and at some point you paused and said, wait a minute, what is this about? And you decided to go deep in thinking about the Second Amendment and the culture that has created an environment right. where these guns are things that are readily accessible and people get them and acquire them. And you mm -hmm. talked about the 30 million people who have them. <laughs> what can you reflect on uh, it's, it's here today, thinking about how this came about and some of the myths that people have about gun culture, where we think about the revolution, right. and we think about guns in the revolution, and we think it being embedded in our constitution. Right. You take that on and tack tackle it in your, as a principal thesis in your book. Yeah, it's a thesis I developed in um, a previous book on an indigenous people's history of the United States. If any of you have read it, if you want even more of that chat, you know, that those early chapters of, uh, of this book where I developed the um, genealogy of the Second Amendment in the colonial era, it's a... Uh, it's related, and I go more into settler colonialism in, in the other book. Uh, this book was intended to be small. It's, a, it's the open media project at City Lights and, and to deal with, with present issues. Um, uh, and in a, you know, in a very, um, uh, what can you say, scholarly way. It has footnotes, it's documented, and I'm a trained historian. But settler colonialism is a particular kind of colonialism uh, unique to a part of the British Empire, um, the North American colonies, New Zealand, Australia, and Canada, or settler colonial. There are others in Africa, um, like uh, also British, like um, uh, Rhodesia and South Africa, although they never came to overpopulate the um, uh, indigenous population, the black Africans. Uh, but they certainly did dominate, as as we know, <laughs> until very recently. Um, so, and Israel is a a settler state. Um, that so it, you can look at Israel and see, you know, the behavior of settlers there taking that dance of uh, taking illegally taking Palestinian land and then getting it um, legalized by the government. So this is how settler colonialism works. It really builds upon land as a commodity. Uh, land and water, of course. Uh, land and water is a commodity. And of course, all the resources on it. And um, then, you know, that's the wealth that is built. So this wealth of uh, agribusiness built in the Caribbean, sugar plantations, the plantations in the south of non-food crops, well, you can consider sugar a food crop, I guess, but you'll die if that's all you eat. Uh, you can eat all bananas and, and probably survive, but not sugar. <laughs> so, so I don't call it a, 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 a food crop, but tobacco, indigo, and of course, king cotton. And um, uh, so these wealthy planters, especially in Virginia, but South Carolina, um, you know, the, the uh, Maryland, uh, upstate New York, uh, the Shiler family, Alexander Hamilton was married to, uh, they brokered in slaves all the time. So it became a slave uh, worked economy and it was completely racialized, institutionalized by the 1670s. But already these militias existed that were self-organized settlers, um, very well regulated. They self-regulated. This is what we know about Americans, right? 
they're, you know, they get things done. Well, okay. So and they're this, good at it. One of the, you talked about, <laughs> that's something that's in the Second Amendment, though. It talks about to a well-regulated militia that's why I mentioned regulated. being necessary to the security of a free state. <laughs> mm -hmm. the, peop, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Right. We tend to think about militias being the contemporary National Guard. Right. Is that your take on the history of militias in the country? Because you reflect on that, too, in terms of what these militias really were well, for that historical yeah, context. That's really the, the key question, because I don't know about all these politicians who, and even the NRA, um, well, the NRA denies it, and they do point out, rightly, that... Um, the militias that became, the state militias that became the national, called the National Guard later, with all the same description, if you, uh, it, I, uh, it's Article 8, I think, in the Constitution, it was provided for. Those were provided for. The U.S. Army was provided for. So this is an individual right under the Bill of Rights. The whole Constitution was about, um, the uh, a creating of a federalism, so the relationship between the states and the federal governments, setting up the division of powers, uh, what the you know powers of the 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 three, the executive, the legislature, and the the Supreme Court, um, and mostly the states. You know when they talk about states' rights, that you know that really is the Constitution. And only interstate, you know, the interstate clause uh, of what the federal government can control. But, for instance, every corporation that exists is, is incorporated in a state. The federal government doesn't incorporate, doesn't incorporate corporation. They may call something a corporation, you know, but they don't. The, it's, it's a public institution. So the these are the individual rights there's nothing about individual rights in in uh or people's rights in it, without the 10 amendments this would clearly be a creation of an oligarchy and it still is kind of with the electoral requirements you know uh cuz the popular vote is is not allowed as we know recently uh to be the you know the decision of uh, who wins an election. So that um, those provisions are made. So if you don't know how these self-organized militias, very effective, and they also then uh, carved out of them slave patrols. Once slavery was large scale, uh, industrial, um, really like a, um, a proletarian system only in bondage. I always say the first, um, the first uh, insurgent proletarians in the United States were enslaved Africans. They were constantly in insurrection. They did not accept their, their existence as slaves. They didn't. They didn't read books about it. They simply knew they had come from freedom, got stolen, and they were property. And they rebelled in every way they could. And there, all these history tests say, oh, they you know, they liked it because they had nice, nice family relationships and all. And that can never be said, but certainly not when it gets out to the Cotton Kingdom after the United States is independent. They were uh, reproducing slaves in Virginia because they had worn out the land and were no longer productive. So they turned it into an industrial reproduction, the women's reproduction of uh, just like you would uh, uh, thoroughbred horses and uh, it's just evil and then marching them in chains you know to sell in the cotton kingdom and this was the main commodity of capital in the United States it was greater than all everything else put together all land all banking all gold all products the bodies of these slaves there in, in, the, in the slave trade. That was the most lucrative uh, enterprise. Uh, it served as mortgages, so anything that property, but it was worth more than land. These bodies were more, worth more than land, especially after the end of the international slave trade, um, which is one of the reasons why I believe the United States, uh, you know, the independence was uh, made. To keep slavery and to keep expanding into Indian land, and both of those things the British came
came to prohibit. So, so, so there are two things, though, that you just talked about conceptually. One was taking land from Native people. The second was fueling the slave trade. And a slave body. You and know, a control. slave body. Yeah. So do you think those are some kind of fundamental things that people don't really recognize or think about when they think about militias? And how does no. that affect discussion about the Second Amendment as you see it? Well, that's what they, they're providing for, is the continuation of these self-organized militias that, um, you know, they control... They At first, they had requirements, like in uh, the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1635, 15 years after the Pilgrims settled. They actually had a requirement that every household um, had to have at least one firearm and a certain am amount, pounds of gunpowder and bullets to load. And we're not to walk out the door without being armed and not even in church or out in the fields working or just walking. Uh, who's going to attack them? A bear, you know? No. Indians, because they're on stolen land and the native people are trying to get it back and also prevent them from expanding it into land that hasn't been taken yet. That's all across the country until 1890, the last massacre, and Indians confined on reservations. So that those militias were taken for granted. There is no discussion, there's no argument about the Second Amendment because everyone knew it wasn't anything. It was like, uh, I, I don't know, um, uh, just a, a uh, it was totally normalized. <clears throat> and it was a provision, like I said, the example of Israel today, this is how the capitalist state, the nation state of the United States became the largest, wealthiest power in the world. By 1840, um, the great, biggest economy and the heart of world capitalism and controls today is these settlers putting their life on the line, I call it bloody footprints, to um, fight the Indians, take their land, burn down their villages, burn their crops, and take already developed land, uh, appropriate it, and push them out as refugees. And, um, and then to, um, uh, of course, then the colony, whatever colony it is, Virginia or whatever, uh, claims it. And then it, you know, then it's, the land is, uh, could be thrown into the real estate market, the land speculation. So George Washington himself was the largest land speculator in the colonies in, in the 1850s. And um, the British had made a proclamation line in 18, uh, 1753 to prevent uh, any settlers English settlers going over the mountain chain, Appalachian and Allegheny, all the whole strip. And those who had gone in illegally were to be brought back. That's what the Stamp Act was for, to pay for the billeting of the soldiers and all those things you don't read in the first 10 amendments that are, what's this about, you know, the right to not billet soldiers? And what are they talking about? Well, they're talking about keeping them from because they don't want more wars with it. These are very powerful Indians by then, have organized incredible resistance. They don't want the wars. They don't want a war with France, because they figure if the Indians make wars, it was always the Fr French, uh, you know, the, the, the Indians getting the French involved and uh, aligned. So it was only at, um, you know, the French and Indian War where the French closed their forts. They were just doing fur trading. They did settler colonialism in Algeria, so you know, it doesn't let them off the hook. And they were doing a kind of um, classic colonialism, creating economic dependency of um, Native people getting proletarianized, of bringing in skins completely against their culture, killing animals just for the skin to sell in order to buy uh, products that they didn't make themselves, you know, European imported products, including guns. Uh, to protect their territories. So this was the situation that 
they, it was to continue, and also to continue slavery, which was provided for in the Constitution, um, to continue the slavery, uh, slavery uh, the, the slave patrols, and that every individual had the right to take land and to, and to own and control slaves. Well, every individual did. No, every white man. <laughs> Sorry. People look like me did. Every white man. <laughs> I can rest assured yes. that's the case. Sorry. So, 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 so when you describe these people, though, and you describe the progression, you're describing these as the rudiments. How is it, though, that today we right. have a view of the Second Amendment, and we are in a, a religious house of worship, and I hear talk about the Constitution, and it's like it's a sacred text. It's right. though there's this covenant with the Second Amendment. Right. How did that come about from rudiments based on t seizing land, as you've described it, repressing black slaves to something that this is wrapped up as all American is apple mm -hmm. pie. This is our covenant. It's part of our, our right as Americans. Right. How did that arise? Yeah, the sacredness of the Constitution, which includes the Second Amendment, um, is, um, is so exceptional in the world. There's no other place where they worship their Constitution Britain doesn't even have one, and they seem to do pretty well. Um, a lot of countries don't have one, and if they have them, they change them. The French have had multiple constitutions. Um, the uh, Bolivia just have a new beautiful constitution, um, uh, giving Mother Earth rights <laughs> in that constitution, and it, it was completely new. They all there was already. You know, there had already been about eight constitutions. So any, any country under the Napoleonic Code, you know, they would have constitutions, but they never were sanctified. That pe that's not an attitude that people had toward their, have toward their constitutions. It's simply the, you know, the way the laws work and changing them for changing circumstances. It's, it, it doesn't work just to add an amendment. You know, because the structure, the inherent structure of the Constitution stays pretty much intact. And if you notice when, you know, the, the emancipation or the freeing of, of um, enslaved Africans, that and there's an exception there, and that is incarceration. And then, of course, the felon is then denied, you know, many, many rights, including the right to have a gun. So that, you know, it, it's sanctified, and that's one of the problems with it. But that's fairly recent, you know, it's pretty recent, that sanctification. Um, and I think that's, um, I mean, maybe you're going to lead me into this, but um, I think we have to understand that the Second Amendment was never debated. There was never, never any legislation until, or certainly no court decision, until the 1930s and the, the prohibition, the gang wars in Chicago, and the Thompson machine gun, which had been created for World War I. It was a real, you know, for really first very advanced automatic weapon. Uh, it still, you know, can uh, function that way. And these gangs had them, and um, they, they simply were outdoing, you know, the local police and the key men, the treasury men that came in, fighting them. So they actually, uh, Congress actually made a law banning uh, the Thompson machine gun. And uh, the NRA came in and testified in favor of it, of, of the banning. So NRA was a stupid gun nut club for sure. And it came out of the Civil War, the Union soldiers wanting you know, to create other little soldiers and arming little boys when they're young, um, teaching them how to shoot. And then this whole myth of the hunter, you know, of uh, you gotta go, you gotta go um, be Daniel Boone in the woods and act out some thing that Indians never did. You know, they mostly trapped, Daniel Boone trapped, and he was only after furs, not meat, you know, to eat. 
um, it was a commercial thing. So that, that whole myth of the hunter is all wrapped up into that. But it leads to a lot of liberals or gun control people actually saying this really ridiculous thing. You don't need an AR-15 to kill a deer. No, that's not what the Second Amendment is about at all. And it gets it completely off the subject and, you know, sort of plays into that myth. So Second Amendment didn't become a thing until 1977. Now, what happened between 1950 and 1977? A revolution. The civil right, the black freedom revolution. That then, you know, uh, freedom movements tend to become infectious, which is a good thing. Um, and so there's the red power movement, the brown power movement, the farmer, the, the uh, farm workers movement here in California, gay and lesbian women's movement. And this immediate reaction was the, the Brown versus Board of Education decision. I remember it. I, w I was a child, but I remember how the white people in that town and the preacher, the Southern Baptist preacher, reacted to that with utter terror. They're going to take over. They're going to take over completely. They're going to kill us all off. They're going to, you know, I mean, terror. But it was really at the top that they first started forming this constitutional ori originalism um, with the John Birch Society. And that was found in Orange County, California. Uh, John Birch was the scion of the candy, Welch candy, uh, yeah, Welch, who founded it, was the scion of the candy, candy-making billionaires. And uh, Fred Koch, uh, Koch Industries, was a charter member. So this was at a high corporate level. Then there's these liberals, you know, like the Rockefellers, even Republican. The Republican Party was still pretty liberal. Um, uh, it was changing fast, but it's still in New York, you know, and it's a Republican uh, uh, enlightened liberals um, who um, saw the writing on the wall too, but wanted to accommodate, to not change too much, but accommodate. To yeah, writing on the wall about what? You about know, freedom, government. you know, about revolution in the United States. Because class, I mean, the, the the reason for deindustrialization was revolution. You know, you take away the factories, you take away the militant workers. They no longer have jobs. As they were all on fire. Everything in this country was on fire at every level. Uh, they have high school kids now protesting, which is really nice to see. We had middle school kids protesting the war in Vietnam and anti-racism, middle school. Well, and around that time, he, in the Bay Area, there was the Black Panther movement. Mm -hmm. And during that time, we also saw them invoking the Second Amendment. Yeah. What was the response to that invocation? It might be a good demonstration today because they probably get shot, but um, it, <laughs> it put the first gun laws in California through. Uh, you know, there's. Yeah, so, so you, you well, glossed over that. The, so the first yeah, gun laws so, in California were signed by. Governor Ronald yeah. Reagan yeah. in response to... Well, it's complicated because, well, I was here at the time, you know, and um, it happened. And that, you know, that had been going through the legislature. I don't think it was in a response... I don't think the, the legislation was proposed because of the Black Panthers, because they weren't even that well known yet. Um, they hadn't, you know, come to Sacramento yet. Uh, so it was simply um, a legislation. It was fairly, fairly minor, you know, kind of outlawing uh, automatic weapons and back, some background checks and all. And it was happening in many states. But the Panthers' reaction to it, uh, was, it was the greatest uh, uh, radical theater ever. Uh, they went up, it was legal to carry um, a loaded shotgun. Open carry was legal in California, a shotgun or rifle, a long gun, and um, loaded. 
uh, anywhere, public spaces, anywhere. And they went up with their loaded shotguns and demonstrated against the legislation. And it passed so fast. <laughs> While that demonstration was going on, and uh, there's wonderful footage you can find on YouTube and all of uh, Bobby Seale talking in the face of uh, one of the policemen uh, says, you got, you know, you have a, a sawed-off shotgun, that's illegal. And he says, ain't no sawed-off, it's just like yours, it's a police special, perfectly legal. <laughs> and it's like, he, you know, they had really read this stuff and they were, um, they were, they, they were stopping, you know, mainly just in Oakland, uh, patrolling the streets and patrolling uh, when an African American would be um, profiled and stopped for maybe a taillight, maybe for nothing at all. But then it would end up either in a death or an arrest for nothing at all, and or maybe there had been some ticket that hadn't been paid or you know something like that. One thing led to another, just like it does today, and um, they would get out and start, they didn't have guns, they had books, you know, they had the Constitution and uh, the laws, and they knew them very well, and they start reading the rights of this person, you know, and um, the, it, it wasn't really about guns, because, you know, the, the civilian usually didn't have guns, they weren't stopping them to look for guns, they were just trying to, you know, put them, incarcerate them, and so that was uh, beautiful, you know, this, uh, what they were doing, patrolling the streets. And it got attention locally, but it really wasn't um, uh, until they went to Sacramento. That, uh, so there are a lot of groups now, you know, social justice groups, well, anti-fa groups, anti-racist, white groups. Um, and some black groups I hear arguing that the Second Amendment is useful. Uh, it should be protected because it also protects those of us who are social justice people. But I think that's a flawed argument because first of all, it wasn't created for us and it wasn't respected in the Panthers case. They ended up imprisoned, killed. Some of them are still in prison. They were punished because if you criminalize a person, they don't have these rights. And if you are fighting to change the society, you're gonna be criminalized. So you don't have that right anyway. So it makes no sense. Unless you, you think, you know, an armed revolution is, but don't rely on the Second Amendment. That's why I say, you know, freedom movements don't need the Second Amendment to defend themselves. That's international human rights law. You have the right to defend yourself. So, and, you know, that's not going to get you anywhere with the courts, but neither will the Second Amendment, because well, you'll be criminalized. So we're going to take some questions from the audience, and the way questions work here is that Rebecca will be circulating cards, and you can fill out your questions, and we'll really work to get through them uh, in the next 10 minutes. Oh, uh, 10 but minutes. The, uh, but the first question that we have is related to a chapter in your book, which comes late in the book, which is about mass shootings. And the question is, after the carnage of mass shootings, where's the moral outrage in this country? Are we immune? Can you speak a little bit to that question and also why you address the issue of mass shootings so late in your book and contextualizing mass shootings in this entire discussion? Well, mass shootings are... Um a symptom of something else. And that's, um, you know, the proliferation of weapons, the doubling of the number of weapons. And in 1997, um, a white nationalist organization, the state of Washington, took over the NRA. And it was called the Second Amendment Foundation. Harlan Carter, who had been a border guard, a vicious border guard, had killed Mexican kids and never was punished for it. Um, a vicious white nationalist who, um, racist, uh, and they took over the NRA. It took four years. They formed in 1974, and they had their eyes on the NRA as an established, you know, they, they were kind of underground. They weren't a legal group. Um, they were a militia, <laughs> and they uh, took over um, the leadership of the NRA, and that's when the Second Amendment clicked in as... Uh, and all this originalism and everything. So 
I see mass killings as, you know, they're, first of all, if you do numbers, um, even number, numbers of gun deaths, and you compare it to things like, um, you know, automobile crashes and stuff like that, it's, uh, uh, it's, you, you can use statistics and say, it's not that big a problem. But it is because of, I, see, I see the Second Amendment as a, as a tool used by white nationalists to um, defend their violence. So I, in a way, the Second Amendment has become, since it's no longer used for those original purposes, Indian militias and, and slave patrols, it's become a symbol of why it's okay for each gun owner to have eight or more guns. You know, if you have one gun, well, okay. But why did our group collect? We had 12. And it's nothing in Oklahoma for, for so-called gun collectors. I call them gun hoarders and addictive gun owners. To own 40, that guy, that Las Vegas uh, shooter, they, they don't know if they've even found all his guns, but all of them were legal. Well, these shootings capture our attention, at least in a moment. Uh, do you think they are going to help propel us to some kind of solution? Well, it, it's really encouraging now because in the past, it's, it's covered up so fast. Sandy Hook was what really was a turning point for me in, um, in saying this is, you know, this isn't going to change. I mean, how could, how could it not? when little babies are killed. Uh, it, it was just beyond belief. And the mother was a gun hoarder. She was a gun nut. She was rich. She thought it was good therapy to teach her Asperger, uh, uh, autism spectrum kid target shooting. She taught him how to shoot. He, she had about 30 high-powered weapons in the house. Of course, he killed her first. And <clears throat> then went to the school. So that, you know, but this is something different. I think we are in a different moment. It just so happened the book came out at this time. I was, you know, and then after, after Sandy Hook and then after Orlando and after especially the Mother Emanuel Church, the white nationalists shooting the, um, the people in the Mother Emanuel Church on the anniversary of, of DeMarc Vesey's uh, um, insurrection against slavery, um, and then, you know, the shooter in Las Vegas, while I'm writing the book, all that while I'm writing the book, um, I thought this is, you know, it, people are numbed by it, and the NR, they see the NRA as powerful because it has and money and it has a $300 million budget. Grace Cathedral probably has a bigger budget than that. Huh. Hey, they, <laughs> <laughs> Well, across the street, and I'm you can sure make a contribution. <laughs> uh, so, should we? Uh, but, I, so, but certainly, some of these Billy Graham certainly. Mm. But they have a mass base of white nationalists, and there is all the congressional gerrymandering. So they elected a president. So it's really serious business. So I think this mass shooting, where you have articulate high school students from a very wealthy, almost all white uh, school district with their parent, liberal parents behind them, it's a little enclave of Democrats there, uh, it's made a difference because I say, well, they're really using their white privilege to good effect uh, because they can do it. They don't have to raise money. Their parents can afford to send them all these places. And I'm sure people are sending money, but they don't really need it. And I think they're, it is change, it's make, they're keeping it in, you know, it hardly ever lasts more than two or three days. It's just, you know, if you follow these things closely, it takes your breath away. You say, my God, you know, that they're, they're going to forget it immediately. And then... Um, well, in terms of not forgetting... So it's we not going to happen this time. So, well, let's hope. Well, one <laughs> question is, should human rights supporters advocate disarming police, military... What should they do? Yes. I think, first of all, we have to deal with the militarism. You know, the United States is the largest exporter of small arms, well, of all arms, in the world. 
It's a huge business, and it was not deindustrialized. It all has to be done in the U.S. by U.S. workers. Every ship that's built, every gun that's built that's used in war. Uh, so that's one thing that was preserved is, is uh, killing, is, is invading other countries and killing civilians. And using those, I go into the, in the other book in great detail in how uh, the whole military of the United States was built upon uh, the so-called Indian Wars, the wars against Indians, as counterinsurgency, killing, maiming, crushing, terrifying, terrorizing civilians. Civilians, that's exactly what's going on now in Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Afghanistan, and has been for some time. So you see the uptick in gun buying and gun violence uh, since 9-11, since the, the invasion of Afghanistan. But it was always before, it was just kind of behind the scenes, you know, the occupations of Haiti, the uh, marine occupations of Haiti, the occupations of Nicaragua, um, the constant interventions in Latin America. These were all kind of under the, you know, until the big Vietnam War, um, this and, and national liberation movements all over the world and a huge civil rights movement, did we really get a lot of opposition? But most of these wars, people are polled, and 80% of them are against it, but there's no, there's no anti-war movement. Well, now your book ends with a quote from a hip-hop artist that's not oh, necessarily yes. very hopeful. <laughs> no, it's so not. Do I you, just had to use that. <laughs> do, do, you, do you have a current epilogue that uh, you want to send us off with that is But can we read that different? one first? So if we look at this one... <laughs> I love it. She's like, this is great. I'll read it. Racer, uh, rapper Ice-T, in an interview in London soon after the Aurora, Colorado movie house slaughter, was asked his opinion of guns in the U.S. and the gun control effort. He replied, well, that's not going to change anything in the United States. No, the United States is based on guns. Uh, and he quotes uh, Chris, uh, KRS. No, 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 it's KRS. Saying... <laughs> You'll never have justice on stolen land. And they said it much more emphatically. You'll never, never have, have justice, justice on, on stolen land. land. Yep. That's how you end your book. That's the conclusion. You can go to YouTube and listen to it. Yeah. What do you think, as we part today and go forth, you want to send us out with knowing about where we are, reflections on recent events, and what you encourage us to do, going forward in the future? You know, because I, I'm a, um, uh, a dedicated, you know, I dedicated my life to um, change, deep change, and it is my life, it's the thing I care most about. I have to be an optimist because uh, I know that we can change things, but I'm also a historian and uh, kind of, you know, really grateful for that because I, I wouldn't, I know a lot just from how I grew up and observed, you know, with the civil rights movement, uh, putting things in perspective for me of my own community I was growing up in. But I, so I pursued trying to find out the source of that, you know, and, and studying history. We have to, I mean, you don't have to have, you no know, every, don't read any, regular history books, because all U.S. history that is written um, for civics, you know, to basically cover up. You have multiculturalism that has made it, you know, well, now the founders have warts. Okay, warts and all. They did this and that, and yes, but they were men of their time. But they created the most perfect document ever created for the most perfect country ever created on Earth. Uh, so... We have to face up to it, and it's not easy because we all have um, nationalism in us, and we, uh, a lot of it's white national. I mean, it really is structurally white nationalism that we're not acknowledging. So it's not just the surface things like language, you know, slur words, uh, anti-racist things. It's, um, it's that we also have in all of us um, a loyalty, a patriotism, uh, a thing that, it, an ugly kind of, I don't think all nationalisms are bad. I don't think black nationalism or red nationalism 
are, are evil. They're not the same things. It's the dominant imperialistic um, uh, state that is um, uh, inherently, inherently white nationalist. And uh, the whole mythology about the United States, even its more liberal versions, are basically their white nationalism. It's like maybe the liberals say, oh, those other people can come in and be citizens. They're welcome. You know, how patronizing, you know? Well, who are you to welcome them, you know? Uh, just because you're white. You know? like, so, uh, and, and I don't think immigrants right now, of course, but some immigrants never feel secure here, you know, because it, it isn't really secure. And especially we need to also, the other thing we need to understand is the border. And we have one in, in the state, so we have a special responsibility. When people say immigration, uh, you know, when they say nasty things about immigration, and, and you know, Trump has said it, they're talking about Mexicans. They're not talking about Hispanics, Latinos. They're not talking about Cubans. They're not talking about Peruvians. They're talking about Mexicans and the extension in Central America, which the United States has tormented and held down uh, ever since their independence. So, so I'll take those as the key. And taken half of Mexico. So the key takeaways is we should educate ourselves. Yes, and we, we should not consider Mexicans immigrants. And we should be mindful of the language that we use and the historical attachments that exist around right. the language that we're using. And as a community, we are committed to exploring that. We love our traditions. We love our history. But we are mindful of those histories and how they inform what we do as we try to be better people. Thank you very much for being with us Thank today. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank all of you. Thank you. Wow, we well, this is the last forum of our winter season. Our work does go forth and we continue. Specifically, this conversation about the Second Amendment and gun issues, there's going to be a panel presentation on March 20th at 7 p.m. on gun <laughs> violence prevention, co-sponsored with Temple Emanuel and the Congregation of Sharif Israel. The panelists include the San Francisco Chief of Police, William Scott, and Mandy Scott, Executive Director of Healing for Our Families and Our Nation. We do want to remind you that Grace Cathedral does not have the budget of many nonprofit organizations, <laughs> and we rely on you for support of the forum, so please make a gift in whatever amount you can before leaving today. I urge you to buy a copy of this important book on sale at the back by Books, Inc. Roxanne will be signing copies in just a moment. We thank you very much for coming, and I encourage you, if you would like, uh, we are a church, and we have services beginning at 11 a.m. We are a house of prayer for all people. All of you are welcome to join us and part of our ecumenical outreach. We welcome you, and thank you again. Thank you.